Emmanuel. This is Pastor Mark coming back to you with our Revelation Bible study. We're going to continue with chapter 6, the place where my slides stopped last time. Uh, I've, added, I've added my slides back in. I added some words into it. But where we're at is the opening of the seven seals. Remember the lamb who was slain, who is worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals. Jesus has opened the first four seals, releasing the four horsemen, showing us the four horsemen, all that's happening in this world. And the fifth seal is where we got to it, the souls under the altar crying out, How long, O Lord? So we're going to go ahead and continue right there. We're in Revelation chapter 6. We're in verse 9, opening of the fifth seal. So we have souls under the altar crying out. Remember, way back in Genesis 4, 10 with Cain and Abel, already back then we have a little bit of a, a look about how this happens. It says, And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. So already they're crying out to God for vengeance. Now, we Christians do not exact vengeance in this world. Romans 12 and Leviticus 19 talk about that, saying God is the one who gets vengeance. He says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. So we don't execute judgment for sins. Rather, we pronounce God's judgment upon the unrepentant. The reason for doing this is we want them to turn from their ways. We want them to repent. God desires repentance. He desires mercy and forgiveness so that everyone would come to know the truth, as Paul says in 1 Timothy. And Peter tells us that's why God seems to, in our eyes, seems to be delayed. He wants all to come to the knowledge of the truth. He wants us to repent of our sins. Now, you're thinking, well, what about you know government and pe putting people in jail and that? God, in Romans 13, we're told that God gives the sword to the leaders in order to uh, keep the peace for us. But we as Christians, and our role as Christians, are called to uh, warn other people, but not to execute that judgment. That's God's role. So these souls are under the altar. They have been martyred for the faith. They've been killed. They're in heaven. And they're under an incense altar which is a symbol of Christians' prayers. The, our prayers rise before God as incense. So now the souls of God's saints who have gone before us, they pray while we also pray. It's our prayers going to God's ears. And God answers them. His answer to their prayer is to give them a white robe. The righteousness of Christ. That's what the white robe symbolizes. The righteousness of Christ that covers them from all their sins. And so it's God is showing them that they have been vindicated. Their trust, their faith in God, even though they were killed for the faith, their trust, their faith in God and, and his faithfulness to them, the white robe shows that they've been vindicated by this. And so he tells them to rest now a little longer, to be at peace. Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus says, my yoke is easy, right? And so he's saying rest confidently, not just because you're in my care now, but rest confidently knowing that I will have vengeance. My justice will be repaid. God's assuring them that what they did was right, that being killed for the faith, their witness, their faith, putting their trust in God, and not only that, but believing that God will repay. He says, I will act on their behalf. So the souls under the altar are praying uh, like we're praying. God is giving them a white robe like we are clothed in baptism. And God is saying, justice will be served. Be patient. I have heard you. Rest in my care. And so he finally says, until all will be complete. Right? says, they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. The completion here, either or, both and, is it the people that are, are specifically killed for the faith? Or is it that all the people, all believers, are together in heaven? Well, martyrdom here depends how you kind of define martyrdom. But basically what it comes down to is until the mission of the church is completed, until we have all joined God in heaven, until that last day, judgment day, all who are giving their lives for, for the faith. 
So with this fifth seal, remember the first four were the four horsemen that uh, are impacting the whole earth. The fifth seal, the church comes into sight in its persecuted, suffering state. While the four horsemen would go on, you know, the earthly powers, the human race pursuing its ambitions, the four horsemen go on in earth, they're going on right now. The church continues to follow the lamb who was slain. That's key for us to remember. We're following one who was slain for us in this world. So the saints under the altar give us a picture of the suffering church during the time of the four horsemen. So in a sense, all Christians are martyrs and that we give witness by our faith. And because of that witness, because of that faith in this world, we suffer. Ultimately, martyrdom is the culmination of the church's witness to the world. And that giving of our life for the faith, for that witness, it glorifies the cross and the resurrection of Christ and his exaltation shows that we are truly following him. So it's not, it's not necessarily a bad thing to suffer. It's, we're told here in Revelation chapter 6 with the fifth seal that that's the life of the church in this earth, in this world. It's going to be one of suffering and struggle. So then we get to that sixth seal, the end of this world. The sixth seal is open. It says, when it was opened, I looked and behold, a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth. The full moon became like blood. The stars of the sky fell to the earth like a fig tree shedding its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So this is a frightful scene to be sure, but it's not unfamiliar from scripture. If you want to pause and look up each one of these, but I have a little bit about them. You see it in Haggai 2, the shaking of the cosmos. Hebrews 12, a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So it's saying the whole world will be shaken, but we belong to a kingdom, God's kingdom, that cannot be shaken. Joel 2, you're probably familiar with that, with Peter's uh, sermon on Pentecost where he quotes it. Sun into darkness, the moon to blood. Isaiah 34, the, the stars are destroyed, the sky is rolled, like, rolled up like a scroll. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus tells him about the end times. He talks all about those cosmic disturbances that accompany the end. Second Peter 3, the heavens are destroyed by fire. The elements are dissolved. This is, as I said, throughout Scripture, the end of the judgment day, the end of the world, is discussed. And they all agree with what Revelation here says also. So here, then, we see... As this is all happening, the people are crying out in anger. They're crying out in fear of God's judgment. They want to hide, but they are unable because there's no place to hide from God. Again, going all the way back to the very beginning, here in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sin against God, and they try and hide from him. They can't hide, can they? We cannot hide from God. Where we go, he is already there. No matter how high we go or how low in the earth we go, no matter the farthest seas, we know God is there. And so here in the last day, uh, the, the non-believers are wanting to hide from God's judgment, just like Adam and Eve, but they are unable. Here what's interesting, it says uh, they were fl uh, fleeing from the wrath of the Lamb. The interesting part is that Jesus is called the Lamb. Usually it's the title Son of Man when Jesus is executing judgment not the lamb. The lamb is the one who was slain to save us. But because Jesus is the lamb who was slain for us, he now is given the right to execute that judgment. It's a dual role of Christ. He's our savior and the executor of judgment. So they are fleeing the lamb, the one who came in to save us, but now they're running away from their savior still. But to us believers, it is a day of vindication. The saints who are crying out on the altar, our prayers rising with theirs, it's our deliverance. Finally, God's justice is served, his vengeance is poured out, and we are saved. So here at the end of Revelation chapter 6, we already see the first view of the end of the world. There's 22 chapters, so you can see this is not a linear book. We've already concluded the end of the world. It's a conclusion of the first vision. And this first, remember there were three visions. This first vision is filled with horror and tribulation, suffering and fear. 
And all this began at the time of the ascension of Jesus. Remember, the apostles were all martyred for the faith, except for the apostle John. But as it goes, he could not be killed, so he was uh, exiled to the island of Patmos where he got this revelation. But the first four seals release the four horsemen. The fifth one shows the suffering of the church. The sixth one shows the end of the age. All this is from the ascension until the very end. But it's chapter 6. And so you read it in line. You read it chapter 4 and chapter 5, and then you'll get to chapter 7. Chapters 4, 5, and 7 surround chapter 6. And chapters 4, 5, and 7 are filled with encouragement, glorious sights, uh, wonderful uh, images for us to hold on to, knowing that that is our future. All right, so that's going to be it for today. I'll get back to chapter 7 another time soon. I just wanted to finish up with chapter 6 here and let you know that it is a difficult world. It is a struggle for us. But read chapter 4 and 5, chapter 5 being the, uh, the coronation of Jesus, and then read chapter 7 where we see the 144,000 that are sealed, all of God's people in heaven. So we see both sides of this. So right now we're in the midst, we're in chapter 6 in our personal lives. But chapter 7 is coming. Chapter 5 has already happened. That's our past and that's our future. We can live in the hope of that. So would you close with prayer with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us this vision through your servant, John. We ask that as we struggle through this world, as we are living in chapter 6, the uh, the five seals having already been opened that we're in the midst of, that you would strengthen our faith to withstand the day, to withstand the evil day that we are in. And keep our eyes focused then on the sixth seal and the end of the world, knowing that you are coming, that you hear our prayers. We continue to cry out on behalf of ourselves and those that we love and on behalf of the whole world. As Revelation ends, we end. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. All right, thank you all for joining us with us in this shortened Bible study, but it's uh, concluding the last one. So God's peace be with you. Bye.